nel chiedervi scusa. The words indigenous, Inuit and Métis people have been waiting to hear for so long in this country. Per la deplorevole condotta di quei membri della Chiesa Cattolica, chiedo perdono a Dio. A statement heard around the world after a week-long visit by a delegation of residential school survivors, elders and chiefs. And while many arrived hoping for an apology, when the words were spoken, it came as a shock to some. The apology that we received today is absolutely historic and so meaningful to so many people. This opens a door for us to continue to move forward on our healing journeys. This historic moment comes nearly a year after the first discovery of unmarked graves across former sites of residential schools, a stark reminder of the atrocities committed by the church, stripping children away from their homes, cultures, and languages, where too many times they faced abuse by the very priests and nuns who were supposed to care for them. Now, Pope Francis says he will visit Canada in the coming months, a gesture many Indigenous people are looking forward to. This week on Context, the apology, a step towards healing and reconciliation. Welcome to Context, I'm Maggie John. As we all listened intently to the words of apology spoken by Pope Francis, our next guest had the opportunity to hear them in person, sitting just feet away from the pontiff. Roseanne Casimir is the chief of Tecumloops Teshwetmek First Nation, the community that was thrust into the spotlight last year when 215 unmarked graves were found buried on the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Chief Roseanne, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. What was it like hearing the apology from Pope Francis? For me, it was, you know, my hope was that the apology wouldn't come until the Pope came to Canada and provided that apology to the survivors here. But part of our delegation were elders, knowledge keepers, as well as um, leadership, but survivors themselves. And for them to hear, witness that apology was extremely meaningful. And for myself to witness that was, was very, very touching. Why was it important that you went to the Vatican? I was asked by um, the British Columbia Assembly of First Nations, BCAFN Regional Chief Terry TG asked me if I would represent British Columbia, and that's representing 203 First Nation communities here. So for myself, I thought it to be extremely important. And, you know, also reflecting that here in Tacomas de Schwatmec, we're also ground zero of the 215 back in May. And the impact that sharing the unmarked graves to the world was extremely important, especially with the fact that the Columbus de Schwetmex residential school here housed up to 500 students mm -hmm. and knowing how many communities that has impacted, all of those different things was extremely important for me to participate in this journey on behalf of our survivors and on behalf of, you know, those that are seeking steps towards reconciliation. And it's, we know that it's still a long ways to go, but it was very meaningful. So I, I guess the question, Chief Roseanne, is, is an apology enough? An apology is, is one step. Mm -hmm. And that is also recognized in the um, calls to action of the truth and reconciliation, number 58 which is that formal apology. It is extremely important. It's about accountability. It's also about um, knowing that the truths of our people have been acknowledged and that a meaningful apology goes with one of those steps moving forward and fulfilling that. What's next? What would you like to see happen when the Pope visits Canada, hopefully later on this year? To you know, 
be here, first of all, in Canada, to be able to make a full, wholesome apology, meaningful apology, and that he has opportunity to hear from survivors of the residential school and to hear their truths and the impacts that it has had on them as well, individually. He's heard from our delegation, but I think it's really important from him to hear from the people as well that you know reside here and to hear their truths and from the truths that were shared with them from the survivors from our delegation who represented right across the nation, but down to the community level and the Indian Residential School and its role that the Roman Catholic Church had with First Nations in Canada. They operated over 70% of the schools here in Canada. And so I think having him here, having him hear from the survivors, also to visit, you know, areas, you know, where there's um, confirmations of unmarked graves here within British Columbia or across Canada and Saskatchewan. I think it would be quite crucial and important to really grasp knowing that the survivors had their, their truths, their pain, their trauma, and for it to be reopened with the announcement of those findings, to really be able to reflect on how that has had on our people and all the um, traumas that they've lived generationally since their residential school experience to where we are at today. Thank you so much, Chief Roseanne Casimir, for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It helped erase the 20 long years that I had spent to meet a gentle, kind of person and even got a hug. A historic day for survivors like Andrew Creer. The Papal Apology is the first call to action listed under Church Apologies and Reconciliation in the Truth and Reconciliation Report released in 2015. Jimmy Thunder is an OG Cree from Sachigo Lake First Nation and the founder of Reconciliation Thunder, a nonprofit that is using social media to raise awareness for the Truth and Reconciliation Report and calls to action. He joins me now. Jimmy, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> what are were your first impressions of the Pope's apology? Well, at first I was a little bit skeptical when I was uh, when I was initially listening because you know we've heard a lot of apologies and we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, things that are done for symbolic reasons or for show. But uh, but as I was listening, um, not only to the apology but just to the whole event, I started to realize like the entire scope of what I was listening to and what I was seeing and experiencing and uh, just the power of it all. I think uh, you know of of somebody of that nature, of that level of influence, of making this apology of something so horrific and so huge, um, it was powerful. It was a really, really powerful experience and it was encouraging and it was refreshing and it was, uh, it was a really good thing. It was a really uh, powerful moment that uh, a lot of us didn't think would happen in our lifetimes, mm. you know? Um, you know, it's, it took the, uh, you know, the vision of the commissioners of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission who called for this apology within a year of the report, uh, you know, which is which is incredibly um, visionary, you know, considering a lot of us didn't think that we would see it in our lifetime. So it was just yeah. it was just a really powerful and good moment. An important part of the call to action number 58 is that the Pope's apology actually happens in Canada. There are indications Pope Francis is intending to come later this year. How can that visit honor Indigenous people in Canada and be a further part of reconciliation? Yeah, well, it's it's like you just said. You know, it was part of the original call to action. It was part of what the uh, what the commissioners originally had in mind when they envisioned what the apology would look like. And so, this is more fulfilling what what we have asked. And mm -hmm. and I think that's a key thing about the power of the apology is to recognize that there are in, in Indigenous voices that have been behind it. Uh, not only for the past couple of years, but for decades. And so this is sort of like a, a response to, to this, the recognition of wrong done and 
the recognition that there's there's a path forward and that Indigenous people are calling for this. And so it's uh, to do it on these terms, I think is just, it, it's it's a powerful statement. And I think it feels incomplete until it's done um, on Canadian soil. You teach Indigenous ministry at Horizon College. How do you think you'll teach about this apology in your course? Yeah, so we have some required reading is the statements of each of the different denominations uh, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. Um, so all of the different um, statements that were made are required reading. And so what is going to happen now is that this, not just the apology, but the entire presentation is going to be something that we're going to be playing during class. It's about, uh, you know, that about an hour long, uh, the final audience with the Pope and uh and I think it's it's going to be it's really important and it's really a historic moment and it will be taught as such. And just even some of the words that uh, the Pope had used to describe this, the the fact that you know the the colonial mentality still remains widespread and there's still work to be done. Uh, it's so true, and I think that it's necessary for us to recognize that. And some other words that he uses, you know, indignation. And so in the context of teaching theology and, and uh, you know, biblical interpretation, looking at, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 11, where it talks about godly sorrow and how godly sorrow uh, leads to all these different things. And, and one of them was indignation. And I think it's just a powerful example of um, a, a Christian leader who's taken this godly sorrow and, and acting it out, you know, and, and this is what it looks like. And so... Um, it's it's just it's a great example for people to follow. The apology is just one of the calls to action for the church. Where are church denominations at with the other calls to action, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, um, it's it, it's important to look at the different resources that are out there. We have the IndigenousWatchdog.org. We have the YellowHeadInstitute.org. CBC Beyond 94 and the Canadian government website that that mm -hmm. shows where we're at with each of the calls to action. Um, but in terms of where we're at denominationally, uh, we have now apologies and responses from all the different denominations, not only the church parties to the settlement, uh, but also even other denominations that weren't directly involved, but feel that that joint uh, need as Christians to respond. And so there is a lot of work yet to be done. We still need to have uh, education strategies for our different uh, church bodies across Canada. Uh, there's a number of these calls that still have yet, uh, we, have, we have still a lot of work to do. And I, I love the final concluding statement that Maurice Sinclair had in his response to the papal apology. It, it's the question of what do you, what are you going to do for reconciliation? I think that's what we need to be asking all of us together as believers. Jimmy Thunder, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Coming up, the Q panel weighs in with their thoughts around the papal apology and what they think should be the next step on the journey to reconciliation. For some, watching the papal apology comes with a mix of emotions. Father Cristino Bouvet is an Indigenous Catholic priest whose Kokum was a residential school survivor. Thank you so much, Father Bouvet, for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. So what was your initial thoughts and reactions when you heard the Pope's apology? It was, for me, in a way, very moving uh, on a way that I had, in a way that I had not expected because I did not go into the delegation going to Rome with the need to hear a papal apology. I know for some there was that, that need that he would explicitly state that. I personally, and even in consultation over the years with my Kokum, felt as though the church has satisfied that in various ways over the last three decades because of the, uh, the convergence of, of cultures and worlds in my life. I'm Italian on my mother's side and Indigenous on my father's side, to hear the Pope speaking Italian to a group of Indigenous people and offering that apology in the context of what has transpired in our country, I don't know, it just stirred 
me up very deeply and uh, it was quite emotional actually. Unpack that for me a little bit, Father Bouvet. I find that fascinating and interesting that you didn't desire or feel the need to hear those words and yet it did move you emotionally. Why is that? Explain that a little bit more for me. I think what, what happened for me personally was that because I am so already engaged in what I consider the ongoing work of reconciliation, and it has been so much a part of my life already, that I'm in the mode of let's keep going, let's keep going. Mm. And wherever I see that we feel like we've come up against obstacles or roadblocks, I, I maybe it's just my nature. I'm, I'm ready to, to say we can get through this. We can, you know, we can get around it or above it. But I know for some, feeling like the Pope had never explicitly stated in those words, I am sorry, was more than just a stumbling block. It was a brick wall. And so I, I, I was challenged to need to stand back and, and stop at that brick wall before I also could move forward with those who were waiting. Hmm. And so when I did hear those words, as someone who didn't need it, it opened my mind and my heart to imagining what it meant for those who did. Hmm. And it immediately resonated with me how powerful, especially for those who were in that room, uh, in the Sala Clementina in the Vatican, what that meant for them to hear yeah. him say those words. The power of those words, yeah. In June, just a week after 215 unmarked graves were found at the site of a residential school in Tecumloops, you said in a homily that an apology uttered is nothing compared to an apology lived. What would an apology lived look like for Indigenous communities and residential school survivors in Canada? For me, uh, the way I've tried to live out my priestly ministry uh, is one that I hope shows that reconciliation is not a box that we can just check off mm -hmm. on a to-do list, but that an investment is being made in the lives of those who have suffered, but then those who, whether they think they have suffered or not, just simply want to receive what we would call the pastoral care of the church. Uh, and so well, while I, I value the, the utterance of the words, I am sorry, or as, as the Holy Father said, I am very sorry. I think people need to make sure that they realize that those words have been preceded by and absolutely will continue to be followed up with concrete action. As an Indigenous man who serves as a priest within the Catholic Church, tell me about that inward tension that you've maybe felt being in your vocation, being where God has called you, but knowing the history of the church in which you work uh, and, and what it has inflicted on a lot of people and the harm that it has caused to a lot of people. The main tension I think I face is this insinuation that I have to take a side, mm. that I have to choose. Who do I want to represent most, mm. uh, my church or my people, my, my cultural uh, inheritance? And I firmly resist that. I, I cannot allow myself to be ripped in half uh, in order to better serve one or the other. Mm. Uh, if anything, what I learned from my Kokum was that before reconciliation can ever take place between individuals, it has to have happened inside of yourself. Mm. And that was what her blessing upon my vocation and the way in which she lived her Christian faith revealed to me the possibility of interior reconciliation being possible. And when that interior reconciliation has occurred, then we can be agents of that exterior reconciliation among others. And she embodied that so powerfully that I can say that it is what motivates me now to resist that, that temptation or that insistence that I have to take aside. Instead, I say, no, I can be both, right? St. Paul said uh, that he desires to be all things to all people in order that a few might be saved. Uh, and so in that vein, I, I desire to be uh, fully Indigenous, fully Catholic, 
fully a priest and not let those be seen as contradictions to each other. So well said. Thank you so much, Father Bouvet, for your time today. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. It was the apology heard around the world, and while many have been waiting to hear those three words, I am sorry, come out of the mouth of the Pope in regards to the atrocities experienced by Indigenous people in this country, no one thought it would come when it did. The Q panel is here to weigh in. Jackie, Brian, and Moira. Moira, I'm going to start with you. The Canadian bishops had apologized. Now the Pope. Thoughts on this? Well, it was a moment that many of us had been waiting for for a long time, and not just Indigenous people, but obviously especially them. And I think it was a wonderful culmination to a week where the Pope very clearly sat and listened to the representatives when they were there at the Vatican with the, at the meeting with him. And he really listened. It's a hallmark, I think, of this Pope, that he, he listens to people, he listens to their stories, he takes it all in. And I mean, what else could you do almost after hearing all those heart-rending stories but to apologize? But I think the way he, in which he gave the apology, and perhaps I'm slightly biased here, I admit it, but I thought it was absolutely beautiful. It seemed to me heartfelt. I think it was very moving. So obviously we have been waiting for this apology for some time now. I would have actually liked to see it go a little bit further in indicating the church's role as an institution in what happened. Um, there was language that the Pope used in his apology, like, I feel shame for the role that a number of Catholics with educational responsibilities have had in the abuse. That makes it seem like it's a few bad apples. It was not. This was widespread, this was systemic, and it was institutional, and it was covered up. And because of that, we, this is just the beginning now. Now that there's a, you know, a formal apology, we need accountability and reparations. Indigenous folks are waiting for this. And I want to see the church not wash its hands of what happened and speak of it as something in the past, so long as they still own land that residential schools are on, so long as the church has stolen Indigenous artifacts in its possession, this is far from being over, Maggie. Brian, your thoughts? Well, I think one of the key things that I think is, is helpful to remember is that there can be no reconciliation without contrition. And I think the contrition that was showed by the Pope um, is a necessary first step. I do think there are plenty of steps to take, as Jackie alluded. But I think one thing that I think is really critical here is the, the, the recognition that Pope Francis, in his apology, made of the actual high degree of alignment between Christianity and Indigenous peoples. And I think one of the things, just to, to, to Jackie's point, and I, I'm going to disagree with her a little bit, is that what the Pope said was that the content of the faith cannot be transmitted in a way contrary to the faith itself. And I think it's worth making a distinction between Christianity and the church itself, as it should be, and the way people within it act, even if people within it were in positions of authority. I think that's critical. And what I think was fascinating was that insofar as the Pope was alluding to the overlap between traditional uh, indigenous ways of understanding things, particularly its love for creation, its respect for multiple generations, seven generations, thinking those, those in those frames, was actually showing the way in which the gospel works. Uh, Lamen Sena, who is a, a West African theologian, talks about um, the challenges and the opportunities that come with missionary cultures. And he says that what happens is when a missionary culture brings um, uh, the gospel into a new culture, it always fails. It will always fail, will often tied with imperial powers, and, and at least in history, that's true. But he notes that there are two things that happen. One is that the gospel unleashes a power of, of revitalization, redemption of the culture to which it's being brought. But, but and this is, I think, a critical point for uh, imperialist settings in which the gospel is brought, that explosion of grace and explosion of redemption ripples back and actually affects the culture that's bringing it. And I think what we're seeing here with this apology mm -hmm. is the reverberation of the explosion of the gospel, which has which has transformed Indigenous communities. I, I thought that was beautiful and a, and, a, and a deeper layer at which to view the apology. Why do you think it took so long? And wh why did it take a delegation going to the Pope before they got this apology? I'm going to start with you, Jackie, and then Moira, you can you can jump in. I think it's PR. We have known about this for some time, 
um, definitely there has been inside intel from individuals who are part of the church hierarchy. But with the discovery of the unmarked graves um, that was happening over last year, this really brought this issue to the forefront of Canadians. It opened up wounds and we were demanding, so many people across the country, across the world, really, were demanding accountability. And the church and the Pope had no option but to respond in this way. And it's unfortunate that that's what it took, but I really think that's what it is. Moira, your thoughts? Well, I think the Truth and Reconciliation Committee really brought home to most people, so before even discovering the graves. Uh, but I think that commission really made many of us much more aware of the facts again as to what had happened. I mean, there is absolutely no doubt that our, the Catholic Church dropped the ball in terms of its response to what came out through the commission and in terms of the commission's demands. I don't actually think it's just PR. I really do think that this is coming from the heart. I think these days people are a lot more aware of our own, the Canadian history, for example, not just the Catholic Church's role in it, but the way Indigenous people have been treated by government, you know, the boil water advisories that are still in place. There are so many areas in which the Catholic Church has to respond, make amends, and society in Canada as a whole as well. The art of an apology is just that, an art. According to an article published by Harvard Medical School, the first step in an apology is to acknowledge the offense, take responsibility. Second, explain what happened without excusing it. Thirdly, express remorse. And lastly, offer to make an amends. The Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 to 24 says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. What we saw happen at the Vatican a few weeks ago was a significant step in the healing journey. But what happens after the words, I am sorry, are uttered? Action will speak louder. For hundreds of years, a group of people have suffered from the generational trauma inflicted upon them in the name of Jesus. Now, we wait for that same name to be the driving force in the long journey of healing. Context Beyond the Headlines invites you to an exciting new season. This year, we're expanding our reach with a brand new podcast that will explore the interaction between faith, justice, culture, ethics, and society. As we move forward with this brand new season and the launch of this brand new podcast, would you consider partnering with Context financially? It is because of the generosity of viewers like you that we're able to continue to tell the stories that matter.